Yan, oh, episode 20. Very special day. We have very special guests. Thank you very much everyone for joining us again. So medyo marami tayong episodes, marami tayong nakausap. And not, but let me just say it, proud din ako na meron tayong balance on many levels, including gender balance. So we have had LGBT, we have had women, we have had Lord De Vera, we have had men, right? <laughs> and today we have, uh, of course, Cecilia Lero, no, a very good friend of ours throughout the days. So we have a very smart academic today, uh, a, a, an activist, and of course, most importantly, right, uh, a, a very progressive person who can shed light on latest issues in the country. So, sorry, medyo na distract ako sa kanya kasi ang fresh ng morning niya tayo mo at tayo warakin. Kasi dito eh. This is, this is so unfair. What, what time anyway, is it there ngayon? What what time is it there eh, right now? 10:30 a.m. Oh my god. So, I thought kasi ano sinabi ni Richard, oh. what did he say? Uh parang nauso ng 1 hour. Start 9:30. Yes. Ay, yung pala Richard. Ano ba yan? But, but I thought 9.30 p.m. sa atin, it's like 9.30 there. Parang I was thinking like D.C., New York pala. So, <laughs> Sao, Sao Paulo ka, di ba? So, Sao Paulo, oh, is, Sao Paulo. Is it's parang... another, it's one more time zone. No, it's yeah, so, one more time zone. Kasi banking ng continent, continent di ba? Yeah, okay. All right. uh-huh. it's, not, it's not very parallel. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so, I had to <laughs> fix my topography. Uh, I was supposed to be in Brazil, but, you know, things happen. Hopefully, we can get there. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for joining us today. Um, uh, Mark, right? do you have any questions before I go into things? Because I'm going to bash the naman ako to be chart na naman eh. Ano Mark, do you have to, ano? Do you have to? Sa, sir, uh, kamusta na dyan? How are things there in Brazil? Uh, um, Sao Paulo, right? Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the, the biggest city of Brazil. Uh, as of this month, November, uh, everything's open. So oh. things are coming back, parties are coming back, uh, vaccination is expected to be finished in this state uh, by this month. So uh, it's still not super great. There's a lot of hunger, a lot of economic crisis, my right. healthcare crisis, of course, but uh, a lot better than where we were last year. Right. So, sounds familiar. Sounds, sounds very home. Sounds very familiar. So on that note, actually, Cecilia, we want to start with your background because yan ang ginagawa namin sa mga guests namin, of course. Uh, you know, celebrity or, or academic or whatever you are, we want people to know better about you beyond the usual stuff that are known about you. Know? So, uh, of course, you know, our introduction for you is that you're an academic postdoctoral fellow based in uh, University of Sao Paulo, right, which is the leading university. Uh, this is the federal state university, parang UP, no? the Liman version, I suppose. State of, University, which is federal, but right. uh, it's, the leading. It's the leading university in Brazil, right? And of course, Brazil is one of the most exciting countries out there, and it's very similar to the Philippines, right? But before we go to Brazil, right, before we make this even more exotic than it is, I want to know a little bit more about you because I think we met, no? Sorry, Mark, hindi ka, wag ka OP, Mark. Eventually, yeah. you'll be friends with our guests, don't worry. Um... Insider stories. No, but honestly, uh, we met each other, if I'm not mistaken, 2009 in a rally, I think Pinoy rally or something like that. Now, you know, of course, this doesn't mean we we're partisan or anything like that, but that was the time I saw you and I think we were kind of in yellow-ish or something like that. So my image of you was like, oh, the yellow girl or something like that. Sorry, don't kill me. But this was really, the, I think that's the only time we really kind of met you and we didn't have much of a conversation throughout the year. So thank you very much for, for responding to our request uh, to have us here. So if I'm not mistaken, you work in the Philippine government during the Pinoy time, right? Uh, but no, I did not work in the government. But you, you were based in the Philippines during the Pinoy time. So can you tell us uh, more about your background before I embarrass myself more? So you're originally a New Yorker, right? New oh, York. I grew up in New York. Right. Uh, I came back to the Philippines and started working in NGOs after college, so a long time ago. That was, I'm a member of Akbayan, which right. at that time was a coalition member with the Pinoy campaign and later the Pinoy government. So I was involved in the campaign, but during the Pinoy years, I went back to graduate school. Uh, I was doing mostly, when I came back to the Philippines, I would come back and do mostly uh, um, NGO work. Right. Uh, I was not working in government. Uh, then later on, I worked in the Senate for a non-LP uh, investigation. That's what I mean, right? Yeah, you work with certain 
policymakers. That's what I mean. Not necessarily in the executive branch, right? Yeah. Yes, but not not LP, not necessarily LP uh, policymakers. Tapos, eh, I was also worked in the House under Congressman then Congressman Tom Villarreal of Bayan. Right. And yun, I, st- I came to Brazil at the end of 2017 after Digong became president uh, for many reasons. Right. Uh, Primarily. Uh, but did you go back to the U.S. <laughs> first? Of uh, the, were you there during Trump era? Um, cause no, Europe- just for visiting, just for working, but not. Right. I never lived in the U.S. during the Trump era, but I was there a lot. Right. So you, you kind of escaped from Duterte, skipped Trump, then ended up in Brazil, which fell under <laughs> Bolsonaro. That's quite an interesting. Yeah. Event, uh, I would say. Exactly. Maybe you're the for, maybe you're the reason this is no. right. Which other I love how when, when Bolsonaro was elected, I said I I pulled on all my training as a social scientist to remind myself that correlation is not causation. I Please don't to. come back to the Philippines until the <laughs> elections because I know who's going to win. No, <laughs> don't say that. Now, I'll see you after elections, hopefully. <laughs> or, or we'll visit you after Bolsonaro. Maybe hopefully a new president next year. So now I, I perfectly can understand what's going on. Why this wave up and apparently it coincides. No, very strong correlation, but Definitely not causation. Um, but by the way, can you a little bit give us a background about this? Because in the previous episode, we Mark Pinagusapan natin sila Kalyodi at si Doc Walden Bellio, and we try to differentiate them from uh yung mga makabayan block, etc. So I, I know many Filipinos are not familiar with this. I was not familiar with this until I worked with Walden Bellio for a while and I worked in the Congress of so Disclosure, also, of course, about my own background. So I, I heard about this reaffirmist, rejectionist, etc. So, you know, this this but of course I saw it in UP, so that but I know a thing or two, right? But you coming from the US, uh, how did you end up with the Akbayan group? What was with the Akbayan group and uh, you know with their ideology and advocacy that that attracted you, uh, and hopefully continues to attract you perhaps in one way or another. And 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 what were the observations you had? Because later on we'll discuss your research. You had a lot of research about the deficiencies and limitations na face na mga liberal reformist center left governments in places like Brazil, Philippines, U.S. among others, right? But before that. How did you get involved with Akbayan among others? Don't worry, I don't think you're going to be red tagged. No, I don't think some Parlad is watching us or something like that. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I saw uh, Professor Walden is a uh, uh, often co author of mine. We work together a lot. I respect him right. a lot. Um, so when I uh, first came to the Philippines as an adult, in my adult years, I worked at an NGO called the Institute for Popular Democracy, right. which had uh, where the mission of the NGO was to take research and really make it applicable in the real world. Hindi yung research for research says kundi right. yung research to actually change people's lives and, and, and inform policy based on science and not just chamba, <laughs> which right. unfortunately is what happens a lot. Right. Um, uh, so at that time, I was exposed to a lot of people from from the democratic left. So these are groups like Akbayan, like uh, Partido de Lakas ng Masa, which uh, uh, I know Kaliodi and, and well, Walden represent now, yes. which at that time was Laban ng Masa. Which um, is not Makabayan block, right? Because Mark was also... not Makabayan block. Right. The just... biggest difference... The biggest difference, as it was explained to me, is that the Makabayan block... Mm-hmm. Uh, believes that they are the vanguard, the left, the progressive group, and right. long space for other progressive groups. Kami, uh, kami lang talaga. Shana, shana, Which is shana. a classic Leninist approach. Right. No? Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, Stalinist, right? That, 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 yes, yeah. that there can only be one. Whereas in the democratic left, what we call ourselves the democratic left, right. it's still on progressivism. We still want uh, uh, to break up monopolies of, of right. power to to uh, democratize beyond the system we have of local elites and and basically ashenderas and old families and mm-hmm. and big business people that run things but we also believe in plurality we don't believe that that there can only be one party that runs things because hey, even if you put me as someone who makes all the decisions i'm going to mess up i need someone to debate me to challenge me okay so good ano mas magulo kami kasi there's not just one party line but right. we believe in 
we don't necessarily believe in pure capitalism, but we also, right. but we do believe in the marketplace of ideas, no? That good faith conversation, good faith debate is better than having a single party line that cannot be questioned. So kind of liberal leftish in a sense, like uh, inclusive, pluralistic, but still with progressive social economic agenda. I mean, is Bernie Sanders, for instance, a kind of a counterpart? Can people think about kind of more famous global icons? Is uh, Alexander sure. Cortez kind of also in that the same mix, right? Democratic left, uh, something like that. I mean, just just for readers, or I'm sorry, audience who are not very familiar about all of this left, because when you say left, ah, Latin communista, right? Yeah, yeah, well, talaga tingin na, diba? But it's actually fifty shades of gray or a thousand shades of gray, in for that matter. Oh, oh, ang dami talagang definition ng left. Pero I think. Alexandria Castro Cortez is a good example. Right. Eh, Bernie is probably a good example too. Yun, yung, eh, what's important is that, kasi magingat tayo sa yung, yung salitang liberal, kasi liberal is also a very loaded word, no? Especially in Philippines now, right? Oo. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, karami ng takakali nila, liberal is dilawan. Ano ba yung dilawan? Hindi rin nila alam, no? <laughs> What does that even mean? They think it's associated. I think liberal party, yung talagang inis, LP, LP, machinery. Yung... Oh, pero ano ba yung LP? For, right. They think it's personalities. Kasi our, our, our politics, unfortunately, is so personality-based. Pero right. when, like, when we use terms that. like liberal as people who study, as political scientists, as people who want to be exact with our terms, right. eh, meron yung, yung sense of liberal democracy na yun, pluralistic, uh, civil liberties, uh, pero meron din yung, yung, yung liberal in the economic sense, which is the government does not interfere, which is... Free market. Free market. Oh, oh, which is not what I am for. Right, right. In so, social liberal din, di ba? Parang... Yeah, tanong mo yun, kasi Mark, di ba, you were also asking me about this because I said, I am a liberal, but not a liberal party liberal, right? I believe in political liberalism, meaning pluralism, hindi lang ako tama, I accept that there, there are diverse views. To a certain degree, I believe that government should not control everything, but I still believe in a certain degree of social democratic commanding heights kind of economy. So this is very different from liberal party, which I think is really more like just free market. Right? It's really about free market, private property, etc. So I think if you want to find the American counterpart, Hindi Democratic Party is more Republican, traditional, Hillary Clinton kind of faction. Again, it's very hard, but I just want to explain because in the Philippines, Liberal Party, Aquino's, Marojas, essentially, that is the representation of liberal politics sa imahinasyon ng, uh, ng, you know, ng ordinaryong Pilipino, no? I would say, even in political okay. discourse. Di ba, Mark? I mean, di ba ganun yun pag sinabi mong liberal? Uh, mga liberal by name na lang, eh. Filipinos ka don't right. understand the word exactly din, eh. Right. Yes, think lang liberal Aquino ka or liberal Marroas ka. Oh. So, so ganun lang I agree, I agree with Mark. Parang yun ang point ko kasi at the end of the day, parties in the Philippines, bukod sa mga parties katulad ng Akbayan, ng Partido right. Lakas ng Masa, even ng Makabayan Block, parties don't really have an ideology yeah. package per se. Right. So, think about another great uh, political scientist that a lot of us uh, respect, Nathan right. Kimpo. Uh, right. I think it was him who wrote uh, political parties in the Philippines are rotating fan clubs of whoever is the candidate at the moment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, kahit sabihin mo sa mga tao na ano, or kahit people think that uh, liberals Aquino or liberals Mar Rojas, they don't really know what that means in terms of economic policy or in terms of social policy. They just think of, ah, is this candidate honest? Is this candidate good? And I really wish that people, I mean, of course, it's an important metric that people base who they support on what they perceive to be the integrity of the candidate. But right. sana they also look at actual policies because at the end of the day, a lot of the politicians who do bad stuff think they're doing something good for the mm-hmm. country. They've convinced themselves of that. Us who have worked in politics know this. Right. Uh, right. So saying, ah, this person loves the country, they all love the country, but which section are they defending more than others? Right. So I think in psychology, there's a term hypocriticism. So if there's hypercriticism, you're very self-critical. Politicians tend to become hypo. So they're not very critical of themselves. They automatically assume they are the interests of the public. So parang suerte kayo, pinanak kayo sa panahon ko. Parang ganun, no? I mean, you could say a lot of people get overwhelmed by that. No, But but uh, Cecilia, I wanted to ask you, so based on your experience, nung time na nasa Pilipinas ka, uh, somewhere circa 2010 to 2015, 16, etc., 
um, anong mga mga basic impressions and overall what are, as a social scientist, as a political scientist, anong mga general extrapolations na nakuha mo dun sa uh, nature of political contestation in the Philippines. For instance, uh, kamusta yung mga left natin, kamusta yung political parties natin, kamusta yung reform agenda and democracy in the Philippines. And the reason I'm asking you, Cecilia, is because you're not just familiar with one developing country versus America, right? Because you're also familiar with another developing country, which is Brazil, which we'll discuss later on. Because I always say, if you only know one country, you know no country. It's only in comparative perspective, especially between two similar countries. That you get to know things. In my case, of course, I'm very familiar with Turkey, uh, with Middle Eastern countries, etc. So I use that as a reference to understand also what's happening on the other. So when you know multiple developing countries, malalaman mo hindi tayo masyadong unique. Yung makalakuan natin mga Pinoy, good luck, pumunta ka sa India, tingnan mo yung traffic nila doon, di ba? Or, or yung mga bola-bola kalakuan. I mean, so, so I think that's why hindi yung mga walang ganyan sa states. So the reason, of course, Cecilia, you're, you're going to be very instructive in your analysis because you're also familiar with other developing countries and besieged democracies like Brazil. But first of all, balik tayo doon sa Pilipinas without using a Western first world standard Ano yung mga, uh, mga findings mo, if I could use that term as a social scientist? But on a personal, emotional level, putting aside academics and jargons, ano yung mga na-feel mo sa Pilipina? Because they say always Filipino, very emotional type, personalistic. But I would say, well, guess what? Boris Johnson did not become the prime minister because he was a policy guy, because you know just people liked him. So personality politics matters in the US, in UK, right? Not only there. And Latin America, my God, they're even more emotional than, as I could say, or Italians, right? Even though they're EU, Italians are the most emotional people you can say, at least in the Western world. So, what are your, your what are your takes now? I, I you think we have to really reflect upon because, just to be honest, so, so, sorry, I'm talking a lot about this because I want to emphasize that no because Mark has been asking me this. We have been asking, "Bakit lumalakas itong authoritarian nostalgia? Bakit Duterte now Marcos?" So we want to understand what went right, what went wrong. And what are the things we have to do in the future, hopefully? That's why I think your view would be very essential. Yes, Cecilia. So, totoo yun. Yung, yung palagi sinasabi ng Pinoy na only in the Philippines nangyayari itong bad thing. Brazilians say the same thing, you know. It's not, it's unfair <laughs> of us to be so pejorative towards ourselves. Um, general impressions. Tamo, nung time na yun, my, my big push of hope, no? Everybody mm-hmm. remembers all this goodwill of the Pinoy government. Mm-hmm. Ako, as an individual, I was more parang calm. <laughs> parang hindi pa nanalo yung revolution. Yeah, excited masyado, yeah. Chill lang. Chill lang. Oh, oh, oh. Chill lang. Kasi, I view that period as a transition period from the 10, almost 11 years of Gloria yeah. when there was Ten a lot years, of yeah. institutional yeah. decay. To a transition to something with stronger institutions, na more inclusive economically and socially. Pero yung yung eh, observations namin from knowing lots of people in government, from knowing lots of people who interacted with government. Because yeah, that that was the time also when government, yung inner workings opened up to civil society. May my chance to come to see inside. Kaya hindi kami kasali. Mm-hmm. At talagang it's a big, slow-moving, very corrupt machine with a lot of, a lot of syndicates in the branches, mm. in, not the branches, in the the executive Parties. agencies. Na, the ruling my, coalition in general, in, in ruling oh, coalition. Yeah. Na kahit may a lot of goodwill, pero in the bureaucracy itself. So even if you change out all the secretaries, secretary still has to deal with. The textbook Director. syndicate, the, ay, marami na akong enemies, the textbook syndicate, the <laughs> bus syndicate, you know. Wag ka so... muna umuwi. Elections <laughs> 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 ka talaga eh. I'm sorry, this podcast is kind of like that. Medyo slippery. Sige, go, go. Parmali. So... Okay, parmali. <laughs> ano pa? <laughs> so, it was a time of a lot of hope, but also a lot of, parang trying to understand how but in the first time we got a look at this big machine and then trying to grapple with how to how to uh, deal with it as people in civil society and as a, a junior coalition partner that basically had one foot in the government and one foot out right. 
how do we deal with this? Because we came from, especially how how I quote unquote grew up in activism in the Philippines. Right. I got my chops during GMA's time. So talagang opposition kami. Eh, talagang every two weeks there's a big scandal, no? Which by today's standards seems like uh, mabagal yung ano. <laughs> boring, <laughs> boring, boring yung GMA days. Boring. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, you were saying it. Thanks for reminding. Kasi tayo medyo mas matanda tayong millennial. Sorry for saying that. Because I think there are a lot of people who forget that there was an Arroyo era. Wala pa masyadong social. Right. Pinoy na lang and Duterte, right? Uh, that's a really good point, Mark. Kasi I was thinking about that as I was brushing my teeth this morning. Parang a lot of people forget about the GMA times. Parang sinasabi nila na, ah... Uh, after Marcos Aquino ruined everything, hello, there's lots of years between right. Marcos and the second Aquino, <laughs> and yeah. lots of really bad years. So, uh, uh, yeah, and so it was really, it was a big challenge also to go from opposition to actually having a chance to, to, um, uh, kind of administration, be right. part of it. Yeah. Uh, but not with a lot of power, but still trying to maximize your space inside to make reforms. Um, but it was a time of, uh, nga, a lot of hope, a lot of frustration. But but um, kaya pala natin, we're on the right track. Right. Uh, at the same time, you see the frustration. But I didn't even know the frustration of the people na, you know, uh, it seemed like such a glowy, wonderful time, but it's hard to the poverty rate did not drop so much. Uh, and I think that's really a setback, uh, already taking a leap into the, the comparative side of a lot of uh, these countries that went through or started their democratic transitions in the 80s, is that kasi there's a big worldwide pressure since the 80s and 90s, pressure coming from the West, coming from developed countries. Third wave democracy, right? Third wave. Oh, third wave democracies. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of pressure in, in the late 80s and 90s, the Washington Consensus, the new economics and everything for us as developing countries to have liberal economic policies, to have economic policies where the government does not insert itself so much and you just let the big businesses go. Oligarchs. Uh, <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. So, and, and the nature of that is that there will be lots of inequality, there will be lots of uh, the dismantling of labor rights, contractualization. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 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 the, the Pinoy government right. tried to implement some social policies to deal with extreme poverty. We always argued it should have been more, but it was better than it was. In conditional uh, cash transfer, mm -hmm. that's what you're referring to. Or peace. Which oh, from... pero, pero, I mean, Walden right? had a really good Walden had a really good uh, article at that time. Na CCT should be part of a holistic anti-poverty solution, right. not just a single program. And yeah, that came from Brazil, but yeah. the called here Bolsa Familia was also part of hugely expanding the federal university program. Right. Uh, mm. Expanding, uh, uh, putting uh, uh, racial quotas for the for for the universities because for who doesn't know, Brazil is a country that's actually fifty percent uh, Afro descendant. Right. It's the uh, last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery, and those inequalities still exist. Um, at the same time, yun din yung ano yung yung criticism from a lot of academics here. Na there were a lot of social policies, a lot of social inclusion policies, but yung dismantling of the exploitative nature of the capitalist state. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Cecilia, can I ask? You? Sorry, Mark, if you want to ask, ask on this, because yeah. I mean, I remember the first times I saw Pinoy. Uh, my, my impression of him was he was very funny. He was very entertaining. I remember also in first speeches in Maros. This is like 2009, 2010, etc. He was a bit stiff, uh, etc. But I don't know. I mean, maybe I was just naive back then. But for me, like Mohang, these guys had the good intentions. I mean, you didn't get this sense that super trapo to mga to na they're just another politicians to choose out and milk out the country. I don't know. I mean, this was my impression back then. Of course, I'm a very different person now. But Ikaw, coming from abroad, coming from New York, it's not like New York is a bastion of good governance itself, right? I mean, it's a messy, messy place. May uh, pagka Manila din eh. Um, kind of first world Manila version. Uh, but what was your impression of, of Pinoy, of Maros, of these people in positions of power when, when this tr transitional situation was happening uh, when you were in the Philippines back in the days? 
I mean, yeah, I saw them. I had a similar impression that there are people mm. who basically wanted to do good. They're not super power hungry. They're not looking to to be in office just to protect their personal businesses, which a lot of politicians are there for that. Uh, you know, they don't come from a progressive tradition. They don't have an ideology now. Ah, oh, this is the holistic my my vision for transforming the state into mm-hmm. a state that that right, right. that has strong institutions that works for the people. You know, They're, my impression at that time, and I could be wrong. Now I put in a con friends, not very close to them. So sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry in advance. That's why we have this podcast. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry, but say it. Yeah. Uh, my impression is that it, it, you know. It was about reformism, about reducing corruption, about making things more efficient. Pero a vision for transformation, kulang pa. Ikaw, Mark, di ba may sinabi ka about that? Na parang, you know, parang back in the days, medyo magana ang feeling mo about this Aquinos and all of that. Pero parang may kapos, di ba? Parang, parang something like that. You were saying something like that in our discussions, di ba, Mark? Uh, yung impressions mo of the, you know, of the Aquinos, etc. I mean, ikaw, Mark, and sa tingin mo, ano yung kulang sa mga So, uh, I'm sorry, so as Aquinos, right? I mean, hindi siya corrupt as a person. I mean, we know that, right? Hindi sila mamamatay tao, right? So they clear some, some of the, they tick some of the boxes, right? But, 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 I, I think, I think, ang, ang, uh, he was too slow on yung mga, infras- mm-hmm. yung dun sa uh, PPP. Sa right, private, public, private public, partnership infrastructure. Yeah. Ang daming mga infrastructure right. projects ang, ang na-delay and, and, uh, Uh, and siguro that's what Duterte capitalized on doon sa kanyang six right. years, yung mga hindi natapos. So, so I think doon, doon sa part na yon. Tapos uh, Pinoy said din na, ano eh, na they were not too good in communicating yung mga achievements niya. Uh, parang, mm. eh, Wala siyang eh, troll farm as much is that what you're saying? Wala <laughs> like siyang vloggers. Let's just spell it out. Because... This was pre-2016 eh. So 2016 right. naman talaga right. sumabog yung lahat nung ano. So, hindi, they didn't expect siguro a world that will be dominated by uh, <laughs> troll farms and pages. Yeah. And, Bakit, uh, mo, Mark, naive sila? You, you think they were naive? They were like, wh- why do you think they didn't anticipate it? I mean, this is politics. Ruthless yan. I mean, you are a vlogger yeah, yourself. No one did in 2016. Hmm. I think, I think, But the Marcos is up in that, right? I, I mean, know, that's... The Marcoses have been active. We discussed this with Lelo, right? Yung mga yellow monkey, all of those stuff. 2012 pa lang, lumalabas yan. So, Sila, you want to tell us something about this? Because I remember we had some discussion uh, the other year about you were already having a hunch of this 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 storm to come, right? Yung mga fake surveys, yung mga online text, yung mga uh, troll farms. We don't actually, have names, but but you, 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 you told me something that alam mo na dati pa na may ganun na parating eh. That the storm uh-oh. was coming. Nung, first, let me qualify na what I said earlier, parang they wanted to just clean up corruption and make things yeah, please worse. Please go ahead. Parang, yeah, sorry, sorry. Parang, parang that's not, it's easy to say it now, oh, that's not really transformative, but it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> after Arroyo. After Arroyo. Oh, oh, this is oh, after Arroyo. Right. Pero going to what you're saying, I remember 2009 pa lang, <clears throat> I was at a press conference with, with uh, our then senatorial candidate, Risa, who's now running again, right. super endorsement. Uh, and in the room next to us, someone else was having a press conference right. saying that uh, actually Corey and Ninoy were uh, were cousins, and that's why Joshua came out the way he did. Oh wow! As in, that's that's well funded. I will not say who it was, but it was a it was a, a well known media personality saying that and the reporters actually came to our room to say grabe hindi ko hindi ko kaya hindi ko mag hindi ko masikmura doon grabe wow so at that at it's that early 2009 we're all area that, that, that place diba it, this is that and it was in Quezon City in the Morato area oh ah, yeah okay okay yeah yeah oh. at a very nice restaurant there so eh uh, as early as 2009 we were already seeing these well produced <laughs> Huh? Sorry, sorry. Hindi Tulfo yan, no? Favorite ni Mark yan, si Tulfo. Hindi ba si Tulfo yan? Hindi, hindi. It wasn't Tulfo. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> going back, going. Nagahanap lang ng trolls, eh. Sige, atake tayo. Go, go, go. Sorry, Mark. And, so that early 2009, we were already seeing yeah, uh, so these well-produced animations co- popping up on YouTube, the truth about the Ed's revolution, ek, ek. Oo, the, ano, the golden age of the Philippines, na... 
uh, coincidental or not coincidentally, probably by design, is another thing that defenders of the dictatorship here in Brazil are using to refer to the era of dictatorship as well. Yeah, interesting. So, so, so hmm, because speaking of the third wave, Philippines and Brazil kind of transition back to democracy, more or less back to back. 1988 pa ang Brazil or 1987? Something like that, right? Ang transition you back to democracy. 1986 some Philippines. Then South oh, Korea, oh. then Argentina, Argentina, then Brazil, right? So more or less mid late oh. 1980s, no? And I think uh, Brazil had even more brutal. No, you martial law, talagang generals in charge. Hindi, like, walang Marcos, talagang generals talaga. No? Can you tell us about the similarities with Brazil? Because I think that might inform also our understanding of situations and comparison. Well, generals talaga, pero, pero there was more, just looking at, at the recorded numbers, there were more killings and more uh, disappearances uh, in the Philippine martial law than in the Brazilian martial law. Really? Oh, yeah. I thought it's the op. Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, the if Argentina, I mean, the Desaparacidos, right? That's that's well known, right? Oh, daming, daming disappearance in Argentina. Meron din naman sa Brazil. At maraming not torture much. sa Brazil. Maraming torture. Pero yung actual recorded killings, my understanding, it's just less in Brazil. Worse in the Philippines, even though it was not oh. a military dictatorship. It was, okay, well, that's... that's even I, even though know, it has I, don't know, I always thought Brazil was even worse than the Philippines. The other thing I remember is that in Brazil, they actually had some few years, at least, of very good industrialization and economic growth, even during their martial law in general years, uh, uh, the time of general, right? I mean, for a while, they probably sure. were not doing too bad, right? Yeah, I mean, at the same as the early Marcos years, same as the early Pinochet years, you know, because you have a government, a centralized government that is spending a lot on right. big ticket infrastructure projects. So you have, you're creating an economic bubble, right? Mm -hmm. We know, you know, classic Keynesianism, economic theory, you spend a lot, you stimulate the economy and oh, you have GDP, GDP growth. That's why in the Philippines, our GDP always has a spike in election years, because similar to the philippines that can't last forever because you're creating first of all you're creating a lot of social strife because you're forcibly moving people from one place or another without adequate social programs why do we have huge slums in manila why do we have huge slums in the cities in brazil because you have uh, um a kind of rapid urbanization incentivized by the government, but without creation of housing or sewage or water. Um, Basically, tapos it's a bubble that's not sustainable. Tapos, kinurakot eventually the economy collapses. And, 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 and Cecilia, um, because one thought uh, experiment I always do is this. Okay, for a moment, let's just put Aquinos and Democrats and reformists all aside. Let's just compare Marcos, martial law, with other similar situations, right? So I always say, in Malaysia, they had Matir who had 20 years of semi-dictatorship, right? Lee Kuan Yew had a little bit longer than that, right? Park Chung-hee in South Korea, shorter than Marcos a little bit, but definitely martial law and dictatorship. Then you had the Kuomintang in Taiwan. I always say this, like in the case of Kuomintang, well, look at Taiwan today. A lot of economic achievements they're enjoying today. The foundations of that was built by the Kuomintang era. I'm not saying that justifies the martial law. I'm just saying their economic record is not as bad as their human rights record. In Korea, we know very well that chables went from oligarchs like ours, and they were forced to become export-oriented industrial giants that they are today, right? Samsung, LG, a lot of this started, they were just like, oligarch session there is like what we had back in the days in 1950s, right? Then in Singapore, well, Singapore is really just a city-state, but then Likuan didn't do too bad in dealing with corruption and very meritocratic bureaucracy. And in Malaysia, well, they have proton, a certain degree of economic development, though, of course, their population is smaller, they have oil resources and all. But granted all of that, even compared to uh, Soharto, I would argue that Marcus' record, economic record, is, is a complete catastrophe, right? I mean, he's an embarrassment to Asian dictators, right? I mean, Deng Xiaoping and Chinese will be embarrassed to be compared to someone like Marcus. But compared to Latin America, kamusta naman siya? Because some would argue maybe we're not really an Asian country because I always joke, I feel more at home in Mexico than in Malaysia, right? Like, I can, it's easier for me to blend in in Mexico. Ciudad Juarez, then let's say in Sarawak, right? Um, so maybe let's say, let's compare Marcos. Let's give a guy a chance. Let's say, okay, maybe you're an embarrassment if I compare you to uh, Park chung Hee. But what about if I compare you to Brazil or Argentina or Pinochet in Chile? How does Marcos fare? 
It's a very good question. I think that, um, well, let's take, first start with Pinochet and Chile, because I think the Pinochet dictatorship gets a lot of, of credit for economic development, institutional development in Chile. Um, but there's a counter argument that even during colonial times, the bureaucratic infrastructure in Chile was better than a lot of other countries. Right. Um, and now we've seen huge protests in Chile in the past uh, a year, mm -hmm. uh, showing that, you know, even this transition out of the Pinochet era, the new constitution left so many benefits for the generals that, that uh, uh, the people are sick of it and and a lot of um uh the revenue from copper which is a big source of of uh, uh chilean exports is not being enjoyed by the people mm -hmm. so we also see the institutional drawbacks so are Argentina, you saying chile i'm sorry are you saying pinochet did well because they had already pre-existing strong state institutions and i think a lot of germans i, I see a lot of german names in chile in, in their elite mm -hmm. in the military and all of that because you can make the same argument also in, in asia right that park chung he could do more with korea the martial law because they already had strong state institutions so it allowed him to discipline the oligarchs but marcus was always overseeing a weak state so maybe i'm sounding to making an excuse for marcus but to be fair to marcus hey <laughs> he was actually overseeing a far weaker state so his ability to dis discipline the elite was far weaker because I, i'm just saying the chile argument is relevant in that sense but it's like your dictator in charge of a ferrari versus a dictator in charge of a jeepney or something like that right so obviously the dictator with ferrari can run faster right uh, you know just sure. simplify it right yeah or you're a dictator that has because it's ability but it's also will right especially in the late years of the Marcos era, a really a national project besides besides uh, uh, cornering all the national industries to make sure they belong in interlocking corporations that end up, at the end of the day funnel all the profits to him. Right. Or his cronies, Juanco, uh, Benedicto, uh, all of these friends. Oh, but, it, in. Yeah. but it all goes back there. Um. Argentina, since the end of the dictatorship, has had multiple currency crises. Um, so, mayo magulo din and very personalistic din ang, ang politics don. Krishner um, family, yeah, essentially. Krishner, the the uh, the wife. Every, huh? Oh oh, it's it's. I don't really want to get into the details because yeah. it's like, no, because I just want uh, we're not pretending to be experts in like party <laughs> policy of these countries. I mean, I'm just saying this as a kind of a layman uh, level uh -huh. of understanding of other countries comparatively. I just because I'm just trying to understand the people here is that see, if I don't even compare si Marcos to Aquinos or whatever, at least we compare natin sa mga similar people in similar era. And for me, the record is not very flattering to Marcos. He didn't do very well, even compared to other dictators. Even in Latin America, you were saying that even the Brazilian uh, generals were not as brutal and perhaps economic. They're not as brutal, and they and they they had uh, a plan for for building up national industry, for building up Brazil as the manufacturing base of South America. Iber, uh, right? I mean, you have air, uh, there's airline industry, right? There's air, aircraft, oh. Iber, and, which the Philippines never had under Marcos. Like, where's our where's our Proton? Where's our Samsung? Where's our che uh, you know? That's what I'm saying. We, what what did Marcos leave to us in terms of major industries and all? I said from Utang that forced us to sell even more state-owned enterprises during Ramos and Corey. Like I keep on saying it. Okay, you don't care about human rights. Well, malaki problema yan. But let's talk about economics. It's not very impressive, my friend. Compared even by dictators, he's an embarrassment. So thanks for reminding me that Brazil, even Brazil, did better than him, both on the human rights. Again, sorry, it's really a low base, but by his it's own really peers, uh -oh. exactly. But by his own peers, right? Compared to his own peers in his own league, he was still a laggard, right? I mean, this is what I'm trying to understand in comparative sense, because that's the only way to properly assess Marcos compared to other dictators or martial law situations. How did he do? But going back to Brazil, because my sense is Brazil has similar problems with us. So Kanina, uh, my episode coming in Mark, we discussed about the disqualification case against Bongbong Marcos, right? For uh, He was not a baby, but governor, right? Something, 1982 to 1985, my tax evasion case, etc. But for some magical, fantastical reasons, he never went to jail or anything. He was just asked to pay a fine, right? Although in any other places, you know, there would be more civil um, consequences. In Brazil, 
uh, similar, I would say, to Argentina and even to Ch Chile, it seems ang nangyari also is nung nakaroon ng democratic transition, it was a, I think what political scientists call pacted transition, right? So there was a right. deal. Now we'll give up power, pero wag nyo kami kulong or wag nyo kami ilagay sa preso or something like, wag mo kami patayin or execute. So in, in, in sense, may impunity rin. Di ba? May impunity rin sa Brazil. That's, that's a big similarity with the Philippines, the culture of impunity. Oh, it was it was a what we would call a transition from above. Na it was a managed transition, and yung nga, I, I, there was the first report of a truth commission about torture came out in when Dilma was president. So what, twenty fifteen? I want to say twenty right, sixteen. Right, right. right. At at mismo, the ex president of Brazil was tortured as well. Yeah. But by that time. No, it was not in the national consciousness. Uh, no one was prosecuted. So, and and I agree that that's a big, this absence of national memory is a big reason why we have all this confusion now. We have people calling for dictatorship, for uh, 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 hearkening back to dictatorship in both the Philippines and Brazil. Why we have the misinformation that was it was only only mga comunista that were victims of of uh, human rights abuses, right. which, I mean, even if they were communists, it's not justified, but marami din, ano, wrong place, wrong time lang. Right. So, I think that's called the Mang Johnny thesis, right? That's the Enrile thesis, which is whoever got tortured is because comunista sila, they were like treasonous and also kind of he was implying so be it, oh, right? The self-serving <laughs> thesis. Yeah, the Mang Johnny <laughs> version of history, I always call it, no? <laughs> So that's, but let me ask again, I don't want to use this jargon because, uh, you know, Mark, you can also come in because I, I'm also asking you, Mark, bakit sa tingin nyo hindi nagkaraw na accountability? Again, of course, you can make the institutional argument, mahina in judicial institutions, not and all, but is there also an element of culture? Again, I know we hate to use the culture argument. I think it's very orientalist and all, but don't you think that culture may also explain it a little bit? I mean, Lee Kuan Yew said something. I not that I agree with him. He said the problem with Philippines is that they are it has a soft culture, you know, like they don't hold like only in the Philippines will they like re-elect someone who pillaged the country to to be you know their hero or something like that. I mean, you hear those arguments even from other dictators or other authoritarian leaders. Now, there's something soft with our Latin, Iberian, Hispanic culture. Now, uh, yeah, like let be and let, let let be and let move on and whatever. You th do you think there's also an aspect of that? For a moment, just put aside our the political science disparagement of these kinds of arguments because I'm part of me feels maybe it makes sense to a certain degree. But we're not very gung ho and on accountability. We just want to have peace and transition and just. We're non confrontational. We want to just just move forward. Do you think there's also an aspect of that, perhaps, to a certain degree? Lack of outrage, lack of this sense of justice, resentment that we have to do something about it. I'm not saying we should be like the French or Russians of you know killing the czars and Bourbons, but 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 why are we like this? I mean, from your understanding, is it something about our culture also? Ah, ako ba? So, sorry. Um, both yeah, of, yeah, both of, yeah. So, Mark, so, ikaw ang tingin mo. Sa akin, from... ah, for, for me, ah, uh, ito namang the whole Marcos revival hmm. nangyayari ngayon. Sa akin, it happened during Duterte's time lang naman. Kasi if, if I remember then, during Pinoy's time, Arroyo's time, it, it was right. still always the Aquinos over the Marcoses. Eh. The Marcoses were shunned. Hmm. Di ba? The... the the dictatorship, uh, pangit, always had a pa parang uh, bad rap in the schools, sa TV. I think yung yung weaponization ng social media allowed allowed the Marcoses to get back eh, and to to get uh, uh, para malagpasan yung yung dating vanguards, yung dating like the ma mainstream media mm. and yung mga institutions, the church. So social media allowed them to ano eh, to uh, uh, find a way na mabaliktad yung narrative and mabaliktad yung story pero in in the last 30 years after people power naman uh, the marcoses were always ano naman were always uh, shunned naman di ba people were uh, uh, parang nakatago na right. if you're a loyalist you're always uh, uh, supposed to be parang uh, quiet lang or uh, in the last five years, they all came out na. They, they all started yeah. ano na. So you, you think Duterte was kind of the, 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 the bridge that opened essentially the, the path for all these pro-Marcos martial law, golden age ec ec to just come yeah. out? 
So if, see, if the Duterte didn't win, you don't think it would have been the floodgate that we see today? Yeah, kasi lalo pa, they share the common enemy. Diba? Yeah. Which is yung, yung Liberal Party and all that. So la- lahat ng... Right. Like, uh, diba, parang sinasabi nga, everything was the fault of the Aquinos, pero uh, mm-hmm. GMA was in power for 10 years and all that. So uh, talagang na-paint ng ganun eh. And that allowed the Marcos spot to get this revival they're, they're experiencing now. But I, if, I, I still remember before 2016 naman, na kaya nga nanalo si Pinoy eh, kasi right. Filipinos uh, were really proud sa people power and lahat ng nangyari at that time. So, yun, uh, for me, ganun, ganun naman. Talagang itong sa social media lang talaga really change. So, it's it's the, essentially the Maria Ressa kind of argument, right? It's like the floodgate got open thanks to the weaponization of social media. Ikaw, Cecilia, what, what is your take on this? Because again, I'll, 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 let me sound very amateur because I look at major political upheavals in the Northern Hemisphere. Give me all the major ones, Russian, French, Iranian, Romanian. I can go on, right? Chinese even, right? And to certainly even... It didn't end up well for those who were taken out of power, right? Like, Good luck with Tokugawa, right? Even in Japan, right? I mean, uh, Park Chung, his daughter didn't do very well. You know, she, she kind of made the comeback, but eventually, well, she ended up in jail. In Russia, the czars didn't end up very well. In the French case, in the Iranian Revolution, the, the Shah didn't end up well. But if you look at here in, South, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, in Brazil, in Philippines, etc., like, no accountability, like regime change, but the onshore regime, they're left there to do what you call, and of course, Walden Bellio has also called in his work, counter-revolution, right? So there's so much room for counter-revolution in this country, right? Assuming the 1986 was really a revolution. Parang, parang, parang tinalo mo, atas iniwan mo lang dyan. Because I remember Waldo Emerson said something very important. If you strike the king, make sure you kill the king. Because if the king survives and comes back, lakot ka, right? In this case, it's like people just struck, struck the king and then left the king, even brought him to the hospital to make sure he's okay and then took care of his children, etc. And then now you're surprised they're coming back? I mean, like, this is... Uh, for me, lang, I mean, I'm just looking at the Northern Hemisphere, Romania, Iran, Russia, etc. Onshan regime, they were brutal to them, right? And uh, um, not in, the, in, in, it's like in Latin America, Philippines, that's not the case. I mean, I'm not saying we should be like that. I'm just saying, is there, what is the explanation here? How, how do you make sense out of that? Aside I from think when you, else, when you said, can we even call it the revolution? Yun talaga yung key. Yeah. Because all the ones you mentioned from the, the global north, not the global north, but from the Northern Hemisphere, right. Are, we're in a different epoka when it was really a right. social revolution. Talagang upheaval ng lahat. Yung sa atin... So may revolve, a revolution kasi it means you revolve it, right? Oh. The, 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 the tire changes, right? So you're saying that didn't happen in 1986. It was not really a revolution. It was just a civilian bakus, as some historians put it. It was a regime change, regime mm-hmm. type change, but it was the beginning of a transition period. All the third wave democracies no have all struggled because right, when right. you go from from an authoritarian system to uh, and you introduce elections tapos you have paonti on the among reforms about how things actually work on the ground uh, there's always who was in power is still in power in the not in the presidential palace but in the provinces marami pa sila nandun you had to make packs of people from who left the military. So in really, nandun pa rin. Eh, Ramos became the president later on, right? One of the president. Yeah. Sila Lushutan, sila Ongpin, nandun pa rin. Diba? San na mga wow. oligarchs, ang galing mga oligarchs, ganun pa. Oo. So, uh, uh, I think it's really a sign. There was a... Um, I'm not sure if it was Fukuyama who we've discussed mm. at length. Um but there comes a time in world history where you know democracy is the name of the game so to speak where if you have these a lot of countries who especially in the global south who are not big powerful countries when they transition they're expected to sort of play by rules of formal democracy to in order to be able to benefit from things like wto aid and um, uh, 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 beneficial trade status. Uh, at the same time, the Western countries who are imposing these these uh, uh, baselines are mm-hmm. interested in democracy in name. Right. It, they, it, there's a delay for them to catch up to what is democracy in quality. 
So uh, about your question, is it, is it a cultural thing? I'm not sure. On the one hand, you have this argument that it's like the Catholic, I forgive you now and your sins are absolved. Right. But on the other hand, you also have this Latin, uh, Filipino, right. very right. macho, uh, I will take revenge, no? I bet if you if you were to survey uh, uh, survey people and say, oh, uh, this person, mm -hmm. uh, uh, my partner cheated on me, do I have the right to kill the other person? 80% mm -hmm. would say, oh, no, man, alak ka na man, di ba? Medyo Juan Luna tayo dun. No, but I mean, the reason I said, look at Spain, General Franco, right? He Not long ago, he had this glamorous cemetery, etc., right? He was... I mean, look at the Francoistas in España, right? I mean, very much like Marcoismo, right? I mean, very similar. I could see that in Spain, for instance, they also have this kind of a let go and let be kind of culture and not only now they're trying to have a reckoning with it under more progressive kind of government or, or something. Yeah, like a few years ago, they, they took down the Franco statue because they right. said this is not a good representation of our history. Right. Uh, going back again to this issue, so you're saying what happened is hindi talaga tayo nagkaroon ng tunay na revolution kung saan talaga magkaroon ng structural transformation of our society, right? Um, and going back to this, because, you know, one of the arguments we discussed in, like, in grad school with political scientists and all is, you know, from eight, 1986 and 1987, for a period, Cory Aquino had absolute powers you know, because there was a suspension of the regime, right? Wala na Marcos eh. At hindi pa na promulgate in 1987 constitution. So some people would argue in that period, Cory Aquino had so much room for radical reforms, land reform, including in Hacienda Luisita, which is a topic that keeps on popping up. No? And we discussed with Lele earlier, with Lord De Vera, among others. We can discuss it again later. So but on my one year see Cory to really do something massive, significant. And yet what she chose was kind of a soft landing, which is like, let's just have a pluralistic, happy, like, some would say if she was a little bit more aggressive all the way, right, and really hammered and bludgeoned some of these oligarchs and put some of them in jail, etc., maybe she would have laid down the foundation long term for a more mature democracy like Korea, like Taiwan, some of our more successful third wave. Because not all third wave are doing bad. Taiwan is doing very well. I was based there. They're doing fun. They're putting US to shame. They're putting Europe to shame. Korea is a very, very mature democracy in many ways. I would say way ahead of many Western countries. So we have neighbors who also transitioned 97, 1987, 19, they did much better than us. Of course, there's an economic factors, but I wanna say that some radical reforms happened after the transition. In the Philippines, it's like, balik lang yung mga pre-Marcos oligarchs, and then the Marcoses were also allowed to come back. Because parang kung mga saling pusa, anything goes and was not done in those crucial years. But of course, someone could say, but Richard, maybe you're, you're, you're overestimating Corey was not a politician. She was not trained for this or, or that this were a complex time. You didn't want to get into war. There was the communists who could take over. There was a cold war. I know. I mean, but that's where great leadership comes, right? Making those decisive transformation reforms in those critical junctures in our history. And I would say 1986 and 1987 was really a radical moment that could have been changed for really pushing for revolution because revolution has faces, right? There's First, you kick out the king or the old guy, but there's a second phase, right? Uh, it could be reign of terror. It could be massive transformation reform. Parang hindi nangyari yan sa Pilipinas eh. Parang more like anarchy lang nangyari, coup d'etat and all until Ramos put it together. I'm just giving my own kind of version of what I feel I kulang dun sa transition period after Marcos. Kaya nagsisir ka tayo. Kaya, kaya we're kind of back to the future tayo again with the situation we're facing. Ikaw, Cecilia, what is your take on that? So I'll say two things about that. First, uh, my understanding is that Corey never had the majority of the armed forces on her side. Ah, civil military. Yeah, That's a good analysis. So, good analysis. But how can you do clean house? But the majority of the people with guns are not loyal to you. Right. Second, you know, it's a really interesting conversation. I couldn't, I've also had this conversation with lots of Brazilians in the mm -hmm. wake of what happened with uh, the Workers' Party here and the progressive governments. And, uh, uh, you know, there's always this this could have, would have. We would like the yeah. government could have, should have. to have done more. Have. Yeah. Uh -oh. kind of, like from someone from my position thinking about the Pinoy years, we thought that he had a lot of political capital that he could have transformed stuff. He mm -hmm. didn't think he had that much political capital. 
Right. Ganon right. din sa Workers' Party dito, uh, uh, people uh, express that they wish that the Workers' Party transformed more. But right. people who are really close to President Lula said he didn't think that it was possible given the configuration of ruling coalition local elites feeling niya hindi niya kinaya politically. So, so... Uh, We're just tiptoeing. Is that what you're saying? Just really tiptoeing, get whatever we can get right because kung medyo we push too much, we might awaken the dragons, right? Like, then the whole thing will fall apart, right? I mean, is that what you're saying? I mean, I can understand. I'm Lula, saying, I think that... so you're saying Lula and Aquino's kind of, there's a kind of a parallel there between Party Trabador and, and, and what's happening also in the case of a liberal party. This kind of a minimalist reformism or kind of half-baked Um, I don't want to say it's reformism. I want to say it's. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to say it's it's minimalist, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's something necessarily uh, specific Bad. to right. the Workers' right. Party or the Liberal Party. It's something that is very basic in politics. If I push so much that I can't get anything done, if the ideal becomes the enemy of anything, right. that's the calculation that politicians that social movements, that civil society, that activists, that policymakers are doing all the time. If I push too much, is the system going to collapse around me and push me out? Mm -hmm. Especially right. when you come to power with very tenuous coalitions. So uh, it's hard for me to just do. I personally think and wish that more had been done at that period, of course. Kinaya ba niya? I don't know. What more, like, uh, in your opinion, no, Mark, what more could they have done? Yung sa Pin uh, Pinoy's time, uh, saan area siya could they have done more? Doon sa mga issues that are close to your heart, that you are fighting for, uh, what could they have done more for progressive causes? Ikaw rin, Mark, can you also tell us your opinion on this? Anong, anong tingin mong kapos ng mga Kinos and all? Because, you know, I, you, have, you, have made, you have been making this argument also throughout some time, no? Nang para may kulang sa sa quote and quote yellow camp and all you think Mark they could have also done more because I want to take your your point on this because you're kind of in the center to the Mark uh you're not anti yellow but you're not pro yellow so I want to also get your point before we get back to Cecilia go Mark honest it's a thing could they have done more about the Marcus issue could or or as Cecilia was saying it's like uh, on the outside us watching a boxer and saying but di mo ni knockout yung pala ubus na yung energy niya he was trying to just survive the round and for us like go knockout mo na yung pala if he missed the swing he's done right he so he's thinking differently from us from outside we see, we see the guy having the chance to have a knockout from inside the guy is actually i have no more energy left if i miss this swing the guy was going to knock me out so i'm just trying to survive this round and be thankful i didn't get knocked out is this Because Cecilia is saying this is the problem we're saying, my asymmetry of perceptions. Ikaw sa tingin mo, Mark, saan naging nagkapos yung, 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 yung so-called yellow project in the Philippines? So you were saying on the social yeah, in, media. In terms of blocking yeah. the Marcoses to, to come back? In, ganun ba? In general, right? Bakit sa tingin mo nawala ng gana ng tao sa mga liberal part aside from Duterte propaganda and all of that? Because I, I don't think Duterte's propaganda would work kung wala rin some basis of frustration. Pero, pero kasi yung, yung mga uh, tin, uh, yung mga hinihirit na kay Pinay, lahat naman ng presidente may problema naman eh. I yes. mean, uh, wala, there, there, wala namang presidente na walang scandals and all that. They just uh, amplified more yung ano na parang lahat kasalanan nila Pinoy and, right. and uh, kanyang mom, di ba? Pero, uh, pero yun nga, siguro they, they could have done more in terms of getting back yung yung uh, yung wealth ill gotten wealth ill gotten wealth and yung what more pa ba so uh... you mean pressure the supreme court kasi yung problema there were times the courts were siding with the marcoses right there were i mean the marcoses got scot free because the judicial institutions sometimes pero ang ganda ng point ni Cecilia na ano eh na after the marcoses left Uh, right. na iwan pa rin naman mar marami marami sa mga allies nila marami sa right. they were all just waiting for the right time to come back at ngayon nga that's what's happening now everyone lahat ng political families from the north are yeah. uh, they are paving the way they are ano na they are full force na uh, for the comeback nitong si si Bongbong di ba so right. ayun eh so hindi hindi ko na that's what I, that's what I'm asking Richard din eh kasi yeah. uh, when, when uh, Lenny ngayon, they are saying na uh, we should stop the Marcoses, we should, ano, pa parang uh, if Lenny wins, what could she do? Diba? Yeah. What, what can right. she do to to uh, prevent this from happening or 
Is there anything yeah. they can do? Like, what are the lessons that Lenny can learn? Because that's my yeah. point. If Lenny wants this to work, she has to make sure hindi maulit yung mga kakulangan. Or, the, the, word, the, word, the word they use is mapanagot eh. Yes. Mapanagot yung... Right. That's, that's what I have an issue with. Kasi six years ang Liberal Party sa Malacanang, wala mm-hmm. namang nanagot. Uh, yeah. So what dif- what what uh, what can she do differently this time? So what do you, you don't think yung ginawa nila kay Jingo and you know uh, Supreme Court Justice Corona? You, you don't no, I'm, I'm talking about the Marcoses. Siyempre yung sa corruption issue. Ako, right. yung sa panahon ni Pinoy, I like yung sa BIR, yung si Lakim Henares. That right, they, beca- right. they became really strict with the taxes. So yun, okay. na- na- I really okay. felt that. Tax collection. Yeah, yeah na- naramdaman ko. So okay din yun kasi... Pero yung yung in terms of the Marcoses, kasi yun yung right. nagiging issue pa rin hanggang ngayon. Eh, lalo na that Bongbong is leading in some of the surveys. Right. So, okay. but what... so like, oh, like, you made a very good point. Essentially, this, this situation, the boxer situation I was saying, right? But nonetheless, um, do you think there were still some major things that were doable and feasible that they didn't do? And it was lack of political will. Whatever that means. Because yung isa pang issue ko is like, what is this political will all of us debate about? Because isn't that the whole Mao Zedong Duterte thing? Basta, you know, kaya natin yan. <laughs> like, but I mean, you, there's so much that political will alone can do, right? It has to work through institutions. It has to have strategy, coherence, vision, etc. But going back to that, w- what were the instances you think na kulang ang political will? Not only kulang yung alignment of forces, if I, I am to use that term, right? Uh, in terms of enabling or empowering reformist governments to push for some transformational uh, changes. I agree with Mark na yung legacy of the Marcos is that was something that that if I'm not mistaken Pinoy himself didn't want to take on because he didn't mm-hmm. want it to look like a fight between two families. But we're living with the result of that now na na the Marcoses were free to uh, create a lot of fairy tales about themselves and <laughs> walang institutional na sagot. Um, um, something that I was really hoping that there would be would, would be an inst, uh, uh, industrial policy na hindi nangyari. So again, the difference between a democratic socialist and a liberal, an economic liberal, yeah. no, is that um, it, it seemed like it, it, the idea was just to have a create a positive business environment for private businesses to flourish. But I would have liked to see more. Uh, um, uh, intentional investment in key sectors uh, um, and since the poverty elevation so you think if, if there was more activist macroeconomic policy eventually that would lay down the foundation for more employment creation and poverty elevation for instance uh, and I mean one thing I understand uh, Cecilia is uh, for instance Economists would say one big problem in the Philippines is utility costs, right? Electricity is so expensive. So when I talk to Japanese investors, they tell me, no, it's not your labor or protests and all of that. That's nonsense. It's really, your utility costs are just so high. It's so expensive to produce cars here in Laguna compared to what we do in Thailand and now in Vietnam or even Indonesia. And obviously, we have a problem there because well, some would say oligopolistic in practices in utility sector. So, so in short, if you want to do a good industrial policy, you also have to have a policy against the oligarchy, right? Or, or something along that line. And ironically, it's Duterte who's making that argument. I'm not saying he's doing that, but it's Duterte who took up the cudgels for, hey, we have to go against oligarchs and open up the economy, etc. I mean, this is also where populists are good, right? They're very opportunistic. They see those, those, those weaknesses and then they present themselves as heroes or false heroes for that matter. And perhaps we can now transition also to the case of Brazil before we end up on the, uh, on the Marcos issue and all, because I know it's almost lunchtime there. But, but I want to understand... How did you personally experience the almost simultaneous or back-to-back rise of Bolsonaro, Trump, I, Duterte, uh, sorry, Duterte, Trump, and, and Bolsonaro? And I would say that Bolsonaro is not the Trump of the tropics. He's the Latino Duterte. But anyways, because just for chronology, chronological purposes, now we need to go. So see, Trump is the Duterte of the West. See, Bolsonaro, the Latino Duterte. But anyways, yeah, going with that. What was your personal experiences and then what do you think is driving this, this, this whole wave of populism? And do you think it's here to stay? Because Lord De Vera was not as pessimistic, diba right, Mark? Parang si Lord is parang, you know, it's very artist way. This is just the latest impressionist fashion. The next thing will be a new art vogue. Don't worry. Parang medyo may pagkaganong si Lord De Vera. Eh. But ikaw, Cecilia, should we be really worried about, is this, is populism here to stay? 
or is populism going to be like COVID-19 more endemic or is it going to mutate and get even scarier if I'm going to use the pandemic uh, parallels here? I think it's something that we still need to be worried about. Mm. Uh, and I think because it goes beyond, at the end of the day, it's not just about 230, it's about 230, no? it's not just about Bolsonaro. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. And I think that we are going to need, in addition to yung, yung, uh, phenomena of what they are and what they represent, yeah. many new problems of the institutional decay that we've lived through in right. these years that they've been in power. No? So going back to my experience, I remember I was here in Brazil in 2015 doing mm -hmm. research. Uh, research. Was <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. This is our podcast. We, we do th things like that. But anyways, going back. Doing your research, yes. Uh -oh. Only uh, research. At that time, parang, diba, Duterte was polling at what 15 percent it was like five to eight percent actually until september oh, parang up late yeah. on the radar but yeah. nobody took him really seriously nobody expected him to win right so you have at the same time these three candidates seemingly coming out of nowhere saying right. crazy pink things right. uh, and as a woman, right? I mean, it's double insult to you. I mean, the misogyny is just shocking. As a man, I'm shocked, but I'm sure a progressive woman like you is double shocked, right? Oh, so for your listeners to know, Bolsonaro was saying he he was a congressman for a long time, right? Didn't actually pass any meaningful laws. Sounds he was familiar. a former. Sounds oh, he was a former military. I don't know, captain, lieutenant, something yeah, like and that. Yeah, and dishonorably charged. Oh, dishonorably yeah. discharged. <laughs> Tapos he made a name for himself by saying crazy things in Congress. Mm -hmm. Sinabi niya sa isang uh, kasama niya dun sa kamera. Uh, I will not even bother to rape you. Parang ganon. Kasi pangit so, ka, something like that. Kasi sa pangit. Something like that. Something like uh -oh. that. Oh, so. Nag joke pa kami noon na I imagine Cecilia, you, Bolsonaro, Duterte, and Trump. Hahaha, <laughs> tapos tumawa kami kasi parang, ah, it's so ludicrous, it's so impossible. <laughs> okay. Oh my God! That was... <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Don't make a joke about Bato and all, man. <laughs> I'm like, serious. Like, you never know. You never know. It's a bongo, diba? Yeah, well, I, have a, I have a question. Ah. Diba, kasi when, when Duterte started out, uh, when he was running, he, he promised that he will be a leftist president. Eh. Socialist uh, also. Eh. Yeah, yeah. So, so what did you think about him then when he was saying, na ganon, did you believe him? And kasi, no then, you saw right <laughs> to him kaagad na no. Oh, kasi if we really look at yung record niya sa Davao, sa Davao, meron naman mga progresibong uh, uh, city ordinances, etc. Pero kausapin mo yung mga taga-Davao, yung mga taga-civil society sa Davao, Duterte had nothing to do with all those ordinances. Napaka-hands-off siya. It's mm. because they had good counselors. Tapos si Duterte, wala siyang, wala siyang interest sa policy making. Ano diba? interest niya? So, so you, you, you knew at that time that he was just... <laughs> <laughs> he was just saying that maybe to to court uh, votes from from the left or to, makabayan block mga ganun. Oh, kasi di ba that block. time yung yung pinaka parang strategist niya was June Evasco yeah. who came from the the, uh, the left. communist left. tradition. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. At Chaco, we know as well that Duterte has a history of working with the mm -hmm. the Makabayan bloc the NPA party in the region. So, talaga my people around him na progressive, kaya din there was a section of the democratic left when he got uh, elected that were really actually hopeful na talagang talagang mawawala yung contractualization, katulad ng sinabi niya. Sabi niya, wala na endo and all of that. Sabi niya, mawawala yung endo, only to backpedal on that Diba? Tapos well, after a few minutes, you know, sabi, what can you say? Nagkala ka ba ever uh, about the, I mean, I mean there were there moments na parang it's so crazy. It might work. You know what I'm saying? Yung parang sa Argo. Yung parang alam, mo, alam mo yung... May moment ka bang ganon? My moment and my specific context. Uh -huh, uh -huh, I hope uh -huh. na talagang maging kamay na bakal siya sa yung bus situation in Metro Manila. Oh, right. <laughs> pero, pero in fairness, oh, yeah. kayo, that's, that's something I like about... Have you seen the, 
uh, are you familiar with what happened now sa bus system sa EDSA sa Metro Manila? Ah, ano yan, Mark? Parang okay na, di ba? Yeah, they Parang made okay. it a... Uh, kasi I saw it sa South America eh. That, that's where I first saw it sa, sa video. Yung BRT, yung bus yung rapid. BRT. Yeah, yeah they, they're doing that here na sa EDSA. In fairness, in fairness. So, on, on that aspect, I think uh, he did good. Na bus Ay, rapid. Hindi ba dyan magaling si Duterte sa mga low-hanging fruits, yung mga... Uh, passport, gawin tenures, license. You know what I'm saying? Yung mga very low-hanging fruits that actually make an impact. Mautake, eh. that's a very good strategy. I mean, I would well, say Isco is doing that somehow, right? Like, sometimes Isco does the mga very basics, but it resonates. Kasi yung mga away na human rights and democracies, which is a bit abstract to average people. Pag, pag sinabi mo, at least wala na yung basura, wala na yung laglag bala. Na alam niyo yung laglag bala, napakalaking issue yan sa panon ni Pinoy, yung Apex Summit and all. All of that stuff, no? So, Duterte is really good in that. Is it the same with Bolsonaro? Is he also like that? Or sobrang sabog lang talaga siya? Sabog lang. <laughs> You're sabog. And it's Duterte, it gets it right once in a while, like a broken clock, no? Kasi grabe yung sa Brazil, di ba? I mean, there are charges against him for homicide. I mean, he was protesting against lockdown. That was crazy because Duterte is the strictest lockdown man. This is where he diverged, oh. right? Suddenly, oh, like, diverge. divergence. Yeah. They, they diverge also on using socialism as a good, as a reference. Ah. Of course, now, so parang yung early Duterte, ah, socialist ako. Yung late Duterte, hindi. Lahat ka komunista. Military. Yeah, puro military. Oh. Yeah. Eh, Bolsonaro was always pro-military. Has connections to what are called militias here, which are basically uh, street gangs made out of Uh, ex and current police who go around basically yung mga tokang cops they go around killing parang people parang the, 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 the squad ish parang ganun ba parang ganun pero much more organized they have their own organizations mm-hmm. na independent pero connected yung mga families right. um uh yung nga super sabog lang si si Bolsonaro eh, eh, eh denialist when it comes to covid yeah. Pero bakit? Kasi he's so pro big business. Mas naging uh, Trump siya. Uh, COVID great. doesn't exist. Yeah. It's just a little flu. Sinabi pa niya, uh, due to my athletic history, I would never get sick with it. Kala right. mo malakas siya. Di ba na so my... siya in some speech recently or something like that? Na hospital siya, di ba? I mean, what's going on with that guy? It's, it's just... It's just I mean, even, even as a Filipino, I'm shocked to see what's going on in, in Brazil. It's, it's crazy. But... But a last point on this, because I know we have talked a lot. I want to beat the record <laughs> with Lord De Vere, but, but no, I mean, going back to this, nonetheless, may mga iba rin sa Brazil compared sa Pilipinas because ang daming EJK nangyari sa Pilipinas dito could be tens of thousands by some accounts, but we never saw major protests. There's a Brazil, parating may massive protests, I would say, not parati, but kasi ito yung, ito yung, kasi ito yung sa akin, uh, Cecilia, you know? and also Mark, no? I always hear dito sa Pilipinas yung term na etsa fatigue. And eh, nag-etsa one, etsa dos na tayo, eh. dapat maayos na lahat, di ba? Parang, wait lang, Brazil, I think they're doing that, right? I mean, there's constant mobilization of the opposition and all. You sent me a video the, the other week or something like that, both sides had, I mean, tignan mo sa Pilipinas, neither DDS nor Dilawan had major protest or anything in the past few years. Even Duterte people, saan yung mga major, yung meeting the avance lang nila, malaking crowd. After that, wala. There's no major oh. crowd that came out for the third. You tell me, Mark, may nakita ka bang 100,000 lumabas for the third? Wala. He cannot mobilize huge numbers. Bye-bye, bye, like... ha? <laughs> Meron pang jeepney na from LG ko pwedeng dalhin, di ba? Tapos nung umulan, wala na daw. But anyways, let's not go to there. I'm talking about 2017, October. But let's not go there. Mababash na naman ako. No, but going back, but in Brazil, the opposition is like, exciting it's uh, you send me those videos like oh my god there wala pa nga kayong EJK and all diba there was a fear na Bolsonaro will do the Duterte style also go favelas and shoot down right and left and kill people it didn't happen as bad right I, I don't think you have an EJK problem as bad as the Philippines right but well, let me uh, yeah tell me about that side because I want to understand where Brazil is quote unquote better than us and what we can learn from Brazil sige let me first address the issue of EJK tapos bakit nakaroon ng malaking mob dito na at wala pa sa Pilipinas. Wala pa ako. Oh, hopeful pa ako. Nagalo <laughs> um, uh, si Marcos yan. Huwag ka lang umuna, umuwi ha. Pero doon, sige, you were saying. <laughs> Ikaw yung dahilan eh. So, so eh, doon sa EJK, historically, my, my 
mas deadly talaga yung police sa Brazil kaysa police sa Pilipinas. Exactly. Yun nga. Uh, police is heavily militarized, heavily militarized, and kill poor people, oo, long arms, and kill poor people sa mga favelas, sa mga slum areas, especially yung mga poor black men, wantonly, walang total impunity. So it's so always... race been... element, which wala dito, kasi oh. dito lahat tayo Pinoy, eh. doon may race element eh. White si Bolsonaro, oh. di ba? Italian pa nga yata siya, di ba? I would also argue na sa Pilipinas meron tayong colorism element, no? Kasi uh, pagpunta ka sa, no, yung mga kaibigan ko doon sa, sa mga communities, uh, sinasabi pa nila nung na-elect si Duterte na karoon ng mga EJK na ay para makalis ako sa bahay, dapat hindi ako magsusunod ng chinelas, dapat naka, nakasapatos, nakasapatos ako, dapat naka, naka damit na social at dapat, dapat nakalutha ako kasi pag may team, payat at nakachinelas, patay ako. Yeah. Yeah. So, Man- meron mananlaban ka bigla. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, But going that's back, sorry, I cut you. So you were sorry, saying, EJK, police, federal, uh, Brasilia, they're, they're better armed and all, but EJK problem doesn't seem to be the same, right? Parang hindi, nakaroon ng increase when Bolsonaro took power kasi he was sending this open message na if the police kill, that's good. There's going to impu- be impunity. I'll protect you. Pero wala yung itong organized from the executive a system of quotas and incentives yeah. na nakaroon sa Pilipinas. Mm. So we had, kumbaga sa, dito sa, sa Brazil, nakaroon ng increase sa Pilipinas, nakaroon talaga ng spike kasi may organized incentive system for killing. Eh, Doon sa mobilization, yeah. Doon sa mobilization, talagang, ano, first of all, mas malakas talaga yung, ano, yung, yung civil society and uh, progressive forces. They always say Philippines has the most civil society, blah, 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 but it doesn't seem so, right? I mean, Oh. has a lot of civil society in the sense na ang galing talaga ng mga civil society workers, ang galing ng mga organizers, pero in terms of talagang reach in the communities, I think mas malakas pa rin sa Brazil. Yeah. Malakas talaga. That is actually the reason why I came here back in 2015 because I did my PhD dissertation on comparative civil society. Right. Kasi you have two punches where talagang malakas, very dynamic, very ano, strong ang civil society. Bakit? Is it because more labor union-ish? Because more industrialization? Because Korea also very strong labor unions. Again, they're more... in because Again, maybe I'm more economist here, but, but yun ang sense ko eh. Like in countries with stronger industrial base, they tend to have stronger unionization and by extension, stronger civil society resistance to authoritarianism. Taiwan, South Korea, Brazil. Uh-oh. Philippines, they industrialize. India, they industrialize. Kaya mahina yung civil society resistance. Yeah, maybe I'm being economistic about this. No, but, no, you're completely... Yeah. You're- You're completely right. I was about to go there right now. Mas malakas yung labor movement sa Brazil. And it's a labor movement that since the 1920s had more structure right. Eh, right. than the one in, in, in the Philippines. Where until actually one of the big projects of Bolsonaro in the far right was to take away, was to repeal the law where eh, all formal employees have to, like, get, eh, eh, have to pay a portion of their, of their sweldo to, to a union, to an approved union. Mm-hmm. So uh, until very recently, all the unions were relatively well resourced. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Mark, what's the name? Yeah, yeah. Uh, tanong lang din ako. Uh, is a progressive movement sa Pilipinas. Where do you think uh, it stands right now? Because I, I, I like yeah. I like to watch like sa US sila Kyle Kolinsky, the secular yeah. talk and all that. Yung yung progressives nila, like sila Bernie Sanders, AOC. Sa Pilipinas yeah. ba? Uh, where do you think uh, we are now and uh, How, how how can the progressive movement grow in the future sa Pilipinas? I think we're rebuilding sa Pilipinas. I think the last couple of years were were lalo with the loss in uh, ano in the 2019 elections. It's really been a period of soul searching of trying to organize again in the essence of a pandemic and yung nga, yung kaya mahalaga din yung ano yung sudden spike in EJKs as opposed to a gradual increase in EJKs kasi takot yung tao shock my my shock and awe my shock and awe my shock my yeah. Yeah. one of the reasons why I left the That Philippines in 2017 because the second half of 2016 to 2017 I was going to funerals every two or three weeks 
di kinaya. How can you organize people like that? They're crying all the time. They're afraid. So, yeah. talagang <laughs> my shock value, my my emotional trauma, no. Yeah. Eh, so so I think it's a time of rebuilding. At saka, an election is a really good focal point for that. Mm-hmm. Kasi, lalo in, in recent weeks, parang sawa na yung tao sa yung takot, sawa na yung tao sa, sa kalungkutan. No? Right. People want to be hopeful again. And uh, no matter who the candidate they're for, it's nice to see na, na positive messages in some way or another coming out. Na people want to dream again that it can be better than what we have. Who are the progressive leaders that you think uh, are the future of the movement in the Philippines? You you mentioned earlier, see si Senator Lisa, but who, mm-hmm. who 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 do you see uh my future who would carry the progressive movement uh dito sa Pilipinas? Who do you see now? Or in Brazil well, also, kung may counterpart, you know, people we have to watch out also in Brazil because I'm very excited about, you have elections also next year. Yung, interesting, di ba? Next year, both Bolsonaro and Duterte's anointed or not so anointed guys will be up for re- for election, right? So can you give us on that? Because we want to wrap on this part. Medyo, hindi naman, uh, hindi naman wild forecast or something like that. Hindi naman fearless. Medyo fearful forecast. Anong <laughs> fearful forecast mo? And who are the good guys and the scary ones to watch out for? Can you tell us a little bit also about that? Thank you, Susan. So, sa Pilipinas, syempre, bias ako kasi my party ako and people that I really trust and work with. So, obviously, Sana Teresa, um, I think I really love and respect uh, uh VP Lenny spokesperson, uh, Attorney Barry Gutierrez, I think he's brilliant. I think when he was in Congress, he did a really great job. Uh, he's not running for anything, but I think intellectually, he's a real focal point of the movement. Um, again, bias the congressman I used to work for, Kong, uh, Tom Villarin, he's also not running, but he's been he's been publishing lately on his uh, Facebook, paano niya iniikot yung buong Mindanao, kinakausap niya yung tao. Yeah, and, Mindanao si Tom, di ba? Yeah. Oo. Yeah. And it's almost uh, uh, cliche na sa kaliwa na palagi sinasabi namin, uh, we have to go back to basics. Pero mukhang back to basics as in ground organizing, talking to people face to face. But mukhang after a year and a half of being online all the time, talagang we need to talk to each other face to face. Balik ka balik ka election after election. Or we will meet pero sa Malaysia muna tayo magpapasok sa territory natin baka manalo siya. Pero fearless forecast mo. Is is Bolsonaro gonna lose next year? I mean, what are the chances for opposition? And dito sa Pilipinas, ah, uh, anong gagawin mo pag nanalo si Bongbong? <laughs> Matatrol na naman ako na to. Yeah, ikaw si sila. Can you tell us uh, about that? Or do you the final start? part of our analysis, yeah. Dito sa Brazil, Bolsonaro is currently polling at, I think, in the 30s or a little less. 25, so, I saw one, right? 25? Uh, yeah, yes, 25. Uh, yeah. So, he's not going to win. Yeah. Mas yung issue now is kasi we're quite sure that Dula, the former president of the PT, is going to run. And he's going to be a very strong candidate. The surveys now are showing na if the elections were today, nanalo siya. Uh, but the problem is that, not the problem, but the challenge is that the rest of... Kasi polarizing figure din siya. Parang, parang katulad na nangyari after in the last years of the Aquino years. Yeah. Nakarang talagang target everything... Kung di- dilaw, everything pula here is bad kasi pula yung kulay nila. Everything demonization total. So, eh, um, pero his chances are good. Mas the challenge is the forces of the right, the big banks especially, uh, yung uh, uh, influential generals, are, we assume that they're in negotiations now about a consensus candidate knowing that, that uh, Bolsonaro will not win. So, so yung isko nila na joke lang Mark. Sino sino yung <laughs> ay Mark ay, hindi mo na kaya. I was like medyo may patama ako. No, just kidding. No, but so who is their compromise candidate of the right? Because Bolsonaro is a kind of a kind of a burned <laughs> you know product sunog na eh. Wala pang malinaw, wala pang malinaw. Isang What are coming uh, out who, who are the people that we have to look out for? 
someone that really wants and is really uh, putting himself out there is the governor of the state of Sao Paulo, João Doria. Uh -huh. Right, of course, of course. Doria is like, a, when he first came out, he was like a Trump-like figure because yes. he's this ostentatious millionaire who, who hosted the apprentice, the version right. the Brazilian yeah. version of the yeah. apprentice. I think I saw him first <laughs> because it's the New York Times, yeah. Uh, so if we have that. Uh, who else on the left, aside from Lula? Is there someone else? Or is the left and center going to uh, coalesce around Lula, na lang, more or less, given that? It's very likely that the left will coalesce. Uh, yeah. The other yung, yung other candidate that ran, the non-PT candidate from the left that ran in 2018 mm -hmm. was uh, a guy named Bolos, who's from a party called PISOL, which is another right. left party, a bit smaller than the PT. But he has a really good relationship with Lula and the Lula well, yeah. core. So I think there's a good Moro, see Sergio, Sergio Moro. I mean, like the sorry, the the the, the lawyer guy, the justice. Moro, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. So for everybody, Moro? Uh, Moro was um, sort of like an independent prosecutor, government. Because yeah. it's my system na yung kung baga yung soldier is not. Uh, it's really independent, independent. Yeah, hindi from siya lang ng presidente na parang bata. Oh, oh. Tapos si Moro naging parang poster boy siya for a bunch of anti-corruption cases against Lula, for yeah. which Lula was absolved <laughs> eventually. Uh, eh, Moro possibly, kasi Moro was the symbol of yung mga yung mga bolsonarista na hindi super bolsonarista pero yung mga ayaw sa PT, yeah. so Workers Party. Eh, pero mukhang it's hard to see where his base is. Hindi siya umiikot yeah. masyado. Uh, at Chaka, he was really he was um, discredited when there were a lot of leaks that came out in the media. Na siya, Chaka yung team niya, they were uh, like corners. Uh, tampering, yeah, uh, tampering yeah, with weaknesses, yeah. etc. So, so in di ako masyadong sure sa kanya. May momentum. Uh, an another name that's coming up is this guy named Luciano Hook, mm -hmm. who is the the host of like. Of like the eat bulaga. <laughs> Tito Soto, oh, oh. this show. <laughs> Eno, masaya na si Mark. Eto yung Tito Soto nila sa Brazil. Maganda. I like this. Very sounds so familiar. <laughs> oh, showbiz parin. Yes. So we'll see. <laughs> so may mga bumba bumbang dance mong yare pag mga nito. Eon. Nako. Maganda. Wala silang pakyao figure yung medyo. Football player, I don't know, boxer, na gusto maging politician, walang gano'n. UFC fighter, gano'n. Oh, <laughs> dami nilang UFC fighter eh. Si Glover, uh, Tashira, uh, matanda na. Uh, uh, Wala mang gano'n sa Brazil? Na pakapresidente? Sports celebrity. No politician. Politician. By, by the way, yung VP ba doon, parang Pilipinas or America? Tandem ba or separate? Tandem. Tandem. Ah, so American system sila, ah, which is good. So, sino katandem ni Lola? Uh, Lola? Lula. Sino maging katandem ni Lula? Sa Silva? It's very possible na maging bolos para masement yung yeah, coalition. Yun yung inisip ko, eh, di ba? Parang yun yung unity team ng opposition na hindi nangyari. So, dito sa Pilipinas, ikaw, Cecilia, ano ang fearful forecast mo? Because things are not looking so impressive so far from your perspective, I would say. No? What is your fearful forecast? Uh... What will happen before you come back to the country next July? <laughs> My schedule na ako sa iyo. We can July at ito, ito yung date na ako sa iyo. Ayun nga, ayun nga sa stop sa iyo sa airport. Sige ba sa? Wag ka umuwi until June, please. <laughs> ayun nga sa Gramsci, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sige. Pessimism lang muna tayo. Mamaya ni optimism of the will. Pessimism. Ah, after elections kung natalo talaga yung Team mo, doon ka na mag-optimism of the wheel. Pero first, let's be pessimistic. I think pessimistic. I, 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 by the way, no, but what is your fear, fearless forecast? W what are your worries and hopes in the coming elections? And I can imagine, of course, maybe Lenny is your most comfortable um, candidate among viable ones. Of course, you can say Caliodi, etc. But, but what is your advice to them? Because some of our audiences are, of course, from that side too. Marami tayong kaisko na audience. Marami din tayo ka Lenny audience. Marami tayo hopefully ka Leody audience. Mga Pacquiao people, we want to bring them in also hopefully. Mga Duterte, wala masyado, no? Wala masyado nag-troll sa atin, no? So far. So far, so good. Ikaw, Cecilia, what is your advice? What is your fearless forecast? So, obviously, BBM is the candidate <laughs> to... 
Bakit? Kasi as we've discussed at length here, years of machinery and disinformation, only pera, hindi pa nahanap lahat ng pera nila sa Luxembourg, Switzerland, etc. So, by the way, many years ago, I met Bong Bong at a, I was at a, some taping of something. I was being uh, being auxiliary to a to a client of mine. So we shook hands. Ang lambot ng kamay niya. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> lambot talaga yan. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Like that. Para sa tayo na na-listen. Pero yan nagpugot ng isang pinggan sa buhay niya. I know. He hasn't touched anything in his life, I think. Very good life. <laughs> Uh, what I would hope to see is na eyes on the prize no sa mga non BBM yeah. candidates uh, speak about yourselves hindi talagang mawawala yung ano yung negative campaigning about the others pero sana yeah, awesome. uh, sinasabi namin wag ano medyo chill tayo sa horizontal violence focus tayo sa vertical <laughs> right yeah right right <laughs> so what do you think of Lenny, by the way? What's your what's your take on Lenny? This pink thing. Do you think this co- rebranding is a good thing? Parang meta ni Zuckerberg. <laughs> is this a Zuckerberg moment or something better? Zuckerberg moment. Because <laughs> uh, not Zuckerberg is a meta. That, that analogy. May din di ba? Kasi nasa bubbles tayo. Parang nung nangyari, I was I, I was also waiting to see if she would uh, announce or not. Tapos when she announced, parang, okay, now what? Pero parang may enthusiasm. So hopefully, mm-hmm. kasi part of campaigning is also momentum, no? Mm-hmm. It's momentum of excitement among your activists and your volunteers. So kung may ganyang momentum talaga. At saka, uh, chapters were really self-organizing before she announced. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I think that the pink thing is more than just a rebranding. Parang it's more than a PR thing. It's also a chance for her to step out of the shadow okay. uh, yeah. of the Aquinos, of the Rojases. Because she's not the same as them. She doesn't come from their same yeah. pedigree in the political family. At talagang may sariling... Robredo, uh, uh, Robredo brands. Yeah. Oh, not just because uh, fair naman that you call it a brand, but because uh, medyo, medyo so ako sa yung ano, we just look at at politics as marketing and communications. Yeah. Obviously, it's very important. But about dun parang her her identity advocacy is the people who work for her yeah. are not all parang hindi sila copy paste na mga noy people or more people. Right. Right. Barry's um, not an LP guy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I'm hopeful that people will see beyond the, the whatever this manufactured hate they have for, for Dilaw yeah. and, and judge on advocacies and actual managerial experience. Cause it's not easy to run an office with no budget. <laughs> right. Right. Ikaw, Mark, do you have some final questions before we wrap this up? Okay naman. Uh, I'm looking forward pagbalik niya. Kailan ba July? So don't listen to Richard. Uh, come back anytime. <laughs> questions. <laughs> I need to Sorry. No, you're welcome to come back. But uh, make sure you're in pink uh, in the... <laughs> <laughs> don't wear black coming back. Wear pink. Uh, 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 Cecilia, do you have any uh, advice for... For uh, I don't know, it's for younger generations. I always say, every, every time you hear like, what is okay, it? I'm not that old, but <laughs> okay. what's your advice for the younger generations and up and coming social scientists, activists, you know, young university students who are like you, you know, Filipina women, smart women, you know, what is your advice to them? Because so, first thing is, here. I really hope to see more social scientists. Mm-hmm. in government mm-hmm. uh, lawyers are great no problem with lawyers some of my best friends are lawyers but we need policy that's based on actual data gathering and data analysis and um, not uh, just legal arguments so sana we have balance of social scientists and lawyers working together because right. right. I'm na, na hurt ako personally, diba? Kasi pag, if you study political science, all of your relatives think, ah, maging lawyer ka. 
Right. Pag sinabi ko, hindi po. Like ano a pre-law nga? only. It's supposed to be pre-law. Oh. Yeah. At di ano, a political scientist, ano yan? That's not, that's not even a real doctor. Tapos you're not even a lawyer, di ba? So, yun, please, let's put data in policy making. First, second, especially for sa mga younger people, don't get depressed with social media. Uh, it's really, really toxic. Mm-hmm. It's especially politically, it's really toxic. Pero sana, uh, we get off our phone sometimes. Finish this YouTube video, pero after this, go out, talk to people. Oh, <laughs> this is on our Spotify and up, so you can do it while jogging. Ah, you yes. can, so you can listen to this while yes, you're walking. this is actually a podcast, but, but kind of oh. Joe Rogan, we do it on YouTube, kasi marami din audience sa YouTube, eh, visual. They want to see how ah, okay. beautiful we look. But actually, this is podcast, so that's why it's long. So we have we have folks who listen to this while jogging and then saying na pangit yung podcast daw. But at least they exercise in the meantime. So I'm happy, right? So, so ikaw, ano bang, ano, do you have a guru lifestyle advice also? Like, what are the things you learned during pandemic for mental health? Because this is a big issue. I, I notice it among students, among younger generations. A lot of people are struggling with so much stress, climate change, you know, all of this politics we have. Ikaw, how do you, how do you stay fresh? <laughs> to use the millimeter, what is your secret to being fresh? Is it the lighting from Umaga, or is it is it is it your toothbrush or something? What is it? How do you how do you stay fresh? How do how can we stay fresh? Find something you really enjoy and don't feel bad about it. All right, thank you very much. Sisa. I wanted to push you more on your dancing and all of that because you're from Brazil. Right I was now. I was transitioning there, pero wala nang time ata, no. No, wait, you're open. You you it's your lunch time. Come in, uh, come in. I uh, know. I think we did more than two hours with Lord, no. So d- don't worry, we we can go on, Papa. Hey, yeah, tell us about the dancing. You want to tell us about the dancing before we close? Because this is a podcast. Hindi ito usual stuff. Hindi ito webinar, right? It sounded like a webinar, but this is not a webinar. Tell us about your dancing and is this the way forward? Because Filipinos, we're so good in everything, right? Might as well also, you know, might as well. Yo, so, yes, I'm active in the samba dancing scene in the schools, the communities here. Yeah, it was smart, a bit... reaction <laughs> <laughs> He's going to interview separately, Mamaya, for Models of Manila. But go ahead, yeah. Ayun talaga, nag... nag, nag uh, natulong sa akin during the pandemic to... Yeah. Have moments of happiness. Oh oh. Um, actually, it's it's cool because uh, people have this. Ah, uh, shout out quick sa yung eskolaji samba di Manila. I first learned in Manila with right. the Guru Aileen Sison. Actually, I really hope na pag uh, everything opens up in Manila, makaron sila ng mas bookings kasi magaling talaga sila. Ayan, uh, Marka! Ayan ang ano natin. Vlog oh. natin next. Punta tayo sa mga yan. Ano na this, Mark? Magana tayo. Yeah, you're saying. <laughs> I like this. It's really, been, it's really been great as a physical activity, a fun thing to do. At saka a way to explore your your Groups. your body, your femininity. Oh, at saka yung culture. Kasi parang when you dance, you learn kasi bilang babae lalo sa 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 Pilipinas super Catholic etc. Right. you grew up being very ashamed no? ilan sa mga atin even if it's 40 degrees we still go out with pants we still go out with long sleeves right. kasi di ba may may itong itong kay 2021 may sinasabi na ah, pag nagbabihis ng a certain way you're asking for it yeah, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. oh so right. samba has really been a way to be unapologetic about being feminine to do it in a place where you feel safe na my people protecting you na hindi ka binabastos right uh, and to make friends kasi another thing uh that that i really want to get across is that um the samba schools are places of people who are it's a popular culture it's working yep. class it's not high yep. culture so it's a way to be involved it's in pretentious oh oh <laughs> to meet people that you wouldn't meet normally at you know some some alta sociedad thing for expats or or uh, at the university right um and a way to also have 
a, a connection to to Afro Brazilian culture, which also gets underrated and under underfunded, under uh, uh, credited. So, napakasaya. Mm-hmm. Siya natural sa Pilipino, di ba? Kasi mahilig tayo sumaya, mahilig tayo sa sa mga drumming, di ba? Yeah. Palagi naalala ko yung mga yung mga tribo sa sa piyesa ng Tondo pag nasa na events ako dito. Right. That's something I really miss talking about about Isko. I used to see him all the time there dun sa piyesa ng Tondo. Hindi niya ako kilala, pero I would Ayan, see him. Mark, ito na, this is chance. Go. Ito na yung segment mo. Next start na yung segment mo. I'm I'm stepping back. Go ahead. No, no. Sige. That was that was a chaka I'm I'm Ilonga so also dinagyan ah, so Ah, you're Ilonga. That's why your analog is like that. I thought it's because you're yes, you're, you're, you're Brazilian. Like <laughs> Sorry, mine is Ilocano, which is not that the best. Also, but... <laughs> is it a Ilonga Bisaya accent, or is it is it just her being just New Yorker Brazilian or something? Okay, again, okay, mine is even. I mean, I'm not saying Ilocanos we have a better. I'm just I'm just kidding about. Thank you very much for that, Cecilia. That, that was that was really something because for me, I think the concept of life world is very important. Something that we tend to forget among intellectuals and social scientists. At the end of the day, if you want to connect to people. You want to inspire people. You have to understand their life world. And the way to get through that is to understand what are they passionate about? What, what is their shtick, right? What gets them ticking? And I think dancing, culture, music, it's something that, that it's really so visceral to us Filipinos. And this is what I love about my Filipino side, because of course, I'm culturally, um, uh, I have a very diverse background. So my dad's side, they're more the contemplative, intellectual side, kind of the Caspian Sea, Eurasian thing, very different kind of culture, right? It's my Filipino side, it's kind of a you know, Hispanic, exciting. This is a very different life world. And honestly, during the pandemic, this was the side that kind of saved my sanity, right? Doing my own CrossFit and dancing, and enjoying. And, and I, this is, I think, what we have to discuss as scholars, as academics, as podcasters, etc. Mark. And Mark is already marking your return date to interview you on your dance. Mark, you should see her. She's a really fantastic dancer. I'm, I'm a very good dancer. Not many people know that because <laughs> they might get too impressed with me and they might not. <laughs> But, but I don't want to go there. I did some dance, parang mala TikTok, and then someone said, Richard, you're so Tito. But <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to make TikTok. But, but anyways, right, we can discuss about that again later. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Mark, do you have Thank any you. other question? Uh, about Thank dancing? you very much. In fair, Isko, magaling si Isko rin yung mga moves niya. So, looking forward, uh, Cecilia, if you come back earlier, hopefully, maybe you can join the Isko or Lenny dancing or whatever. I, I don't think I'm going to see you on the Marcos kind of campaigns, but at least on the other side, please uh, feel free to join us. Thank you so much, Dr. Cecilia Lero, right, based in University of Sao Paulo, a uh, political scientist by training, an activist at heart, but really a dancer <laughs> and a musician and artist right and she looks very fresh today because of the lighting effect and i really feel this is unfair we should have found a common art so i look at myself i look so warag <laughs> and then you look you all you two look better and anyways this is not about me but thank you for bothering to answer my questions and all thank you so much mark mark dancing life world open up Nagising si Mark. Eh. You know, Mark produces like seven videos a day. I mean, this guy is insane. I mean, I mean, you think I'm prolific in my own thing? This guy is crazy. Mark is crazy. Addict din to eh. Hindi in that way. Baka maantay dyan. Pero Mark is also very, very busy. Mark, also, thank you so much, Mark. Enjoy Cebu. Right? Enjoy Cebu. Send our regards to our friends and all. Oy, baka may magalit sa akin. Um, have a good time with, with Yorme, everything. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Have a fresh day. Enjoy your 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 lunch thank you for reminding me that it's not new york time so so now i think i improved my 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 zoning calculations <laughs> thank you so much everyone this is episode 20 project pilipinas as we promise it's going to be extensive it's going to be exciting even if it's almost midnight dito tingnan hyper pa rin ako next we're going to have scientists marine scientists to talk about west philippine sea we're going to have troll farm experts from our friends in harvard we are hoping to have Autumn Aurelio to discuss also journalism and documentary, among others. So we have more guests to come. So please stay in tune, support us on Spotify, on podcasts, and of course, watch us on YouTube, on our individual channels, and also Project Filipinas. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much. Catch up soon. Bye-bye.